Welcome everyone to the 2019-2020 budget hearing presentation. And if everyone would please rise to join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. It's very nice to see such a big crowd. Uh, and we'd like to thank BTV for taping this meeting. In accordance with the rules of public forum as defined in Massachusetts Statute Chapter 30A-20 uh, and with the bridgewater Rainham School Committee Policy BEDH, these are the guidelines we will follow for the hearing. First, please note that this hearing is for informational purposes and the school committee will not vote on the budget as presented this evening. At the conclusion of the hearing, I will entertain a motion to take the budget as presented under advisement. At the school committee meeting scheduled on March 27th at the Rainham Middle School, the budget as presented will be considered and a vote will be taken at that time. For the purpose of tonight's hearing, our budget subcommittee chairperson, Mrs. Julie Scoparis, will present the FY20 budget. We will then ask our superintendent, Mr. Derek Swenson, if he wishes to add anything or to comment on the presentation. Following that, I will entertain any questions or comments from members of the committee. We will then ask for any public input. In conformance with these rules of public forum and our school committee policy, please note that any citizen wishing to speak before the committee should identify him or herself by name and address. A sign-in sheet is on the podium. Our policy requests that each speaker please limit themselves to three minutes, but with the chair, we have discretion in extending that time if appropriate. In accordance with the rules and with permission of the chair, all citizens shall speak to the full committee through the chair and shall not address individual members or administrators. Any committee member may direct questions to any speaker through the chair in order to clarify comments of the speaker. And with no further ado, we will have the school committee take seats in the audience and we will begin. to get to it. Good evening, my name is Julie Scoparis and I am chair of the district's budget subcommittee. This evening I will present the fiscal year 20 proposed budget. Mr. Michael Dolan, Mr. Anthony Gelfi, Dr. Susan Prewodowski, and myself serve on the subcommittee. Next. The fiscal year 20 proposed budget is driven by our commitment to provide our students with a safe, supportive learning environment conducive to educational success as reflected in our mission statement, which is to provide excellence in education for all students in a safe learning environment. Okay. A student success plan is a strategic plan for district and school improvement. The student success plan is driven by four pillars, safe and supportive schools, curriculum instruction, technology, and facilities. The superintendent's original fiscal year 20 budget proposed was $76,508,498. The reality, Bridgewater's commitment to a 3.4% assessment increase requires Raynham's assessment increase to be 3.29%, resulting in a proposed fiscal year budget without debt of $72,560,497. Do the math. This leads to a budget deficit of $3,948,001 from the superintendent's original fiscal year budget. However, the budget deficit was met by utilization of funds from school choice, base, circuit breaker, and excess and deficiency, also known as free cash. <clears throat> Staffing for success. 
18 new positions were re requested in the original proposed fiscal year budget. This budget, zero. This budget results in no new positions, including no new teachers, no, educa no new educational support professionals, and no additional social emotional support positions. However, the district will continue to use existing staff current resources, and our present practice of utilizing interns from the North River Collaborative to address social emotional concerns. Again, of 18 proposed positions, none will be added. <coughs> textbooks and supplies. There will be no funds from this proposed budget to purchase new textbooks and supplies. Any funds left over from the fiscal year 19 budget will be used to pre-purchase supplies. Therefore, this money will not be available for the district's future excess and deficiency account. Textbooks and resources needed to align the district with the new Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed curriculum frameworks for science and social studies were stripped from the budget. Okay. Despite all those reductions, <clears throat> there, is still a, there still is a $400,000 shortfall. Due to the lower than requested town assessment, the district is unable to turn the page in regards to contract obligations and the operational budget. Therefore, to prevent staff layoffs and or the elimination of extracurricular activities including athletics or clubs, the district dug deeper into the revolving accounts and our excess and deficiency account to offset this budgetary shortfall. Again, these funds will not be available to offset future budgets as the continuous use of these funds will eventually deplete these accounts. <clears throat> this budget will result in estimated district-wide classes as shown on this slide. I know it's really small, hard for me to see, but hopefully <clears throat> you can see. These figures do not account for any new move-ins. There will be no funding for additional teachers should we see increased enrollment over the summer. Last year, the district enrolled a total net gain of 86 new students. The highlighted areas are the grades most impacted by the elimination of the superintendent's new staffing requests. For example, at the George Mitchell Elementary School, 10 sections of grade one will be dispersed into nine sections as they enter grade two this will raise the class size even further. At the Merrill Elementary School, the kindergarten class goes from seven sections to six sections as they advance into grade one, resulting in a class size of 20 to seven to 28 students per classroom. To avoid layoffs, which would further increase class sizes, the district used additional money from its emergency funds, such as excess and deficiency and district revolving accounts. All right, okay. This brings us to our fiscal year 20 budget. This is a pictorial representation of each of the state function categories of the budget. This category includes instructional services in deep red and represents 55% of the budget. As you can see, this is the biggest piece of the pie. The expenditures in this category <coughs> include uh, provides students with direct services and includes salaries, expenditures for principals, school secretaries, teachers, educational support professionals, proctors, guidance counselors, psychologists, librarians, and substitutes, as well as expenditures for textbook supplies and classroom technology. Programs with other districts are in orange and represents 5% of the budget. This section includes expenditures for student tuitions to attend schools outside of the bridgewater Raynham district uh, based on individualized ed plans, school choice, or charter schools. Fixed costs are in gray and represent 19% of the budget. Fixed costs include health insurance for active and retired employees, unemployment expenses, building and liability insurance, workman's comp, life insurance, and pension assessments. Unlike town department budgets, this is all included in our total budget. Administration, which is in the blue wedge, represents 3% of the budget. This includes salaries and expenditures for the Office of Superintendent, Business and Finance, and district-wide technology. In black, next to the left of our blue wedge is our asset acquisition wedge. 
This represents allocation of $10,000 to the stabilization fund. We require to include this amount under the 7,000 series. Operation and maintenance represents 7% of the budget and is in green. This section includes salaries for custodian, maintenance, groundskeeping personnel, as well as cleaning supplies, building maintenance, heating, and utilities. <coughs> Other school services is represented in brown at 11% and includes salary for nurses, a school resource officer, expenditures for extracurricular athletic programs, and transportation for regular and special ed students. On the bottom half, not the pie, last year the school committee proposed a $72,310,428 budget, which was eventually reduced to the $70,192,410. Okay. Local revenues, well, how do we pay for it? Miscellaneous receipts, $380,000, which includes Medicaid reimbursements at $250,000 and facility rental fees of $130,000. User fees, $179,000, which includes athletic fees of 150, user fees of $150,000 and parking at $29,000. E&D appropriation, $1 million. Again, that E&D is a savings account emergency fund <clears throat> that we had to dig into after the bills are paid and after the circuit breaker was certified. It's supposed to be for emergencies. Next. Revenue calculations <clears throat> are estimated uh, based on the governor's budget, which hasn't been finalized. State revenue, $23,928,725. District revenue, $1,604,000. And the town assessments, $47,027,772 for a grand total of $72,560,497. Okay, total assessments without debt. Last year for Raynham, $17,914,930. Fiscal year 20, $18,504,284 for percent change year to year of 3.29%. For Bridgewater, fiscal year 19, $27,584,426. Fiscal year 20, $28,523. $523,488 for a percent increase of 3.4%. <clears throat> the percentages are based on the student enrollment, and you can see those numbers at the bottom. Raynham currently, <coughs> or at, as of October 1st, was 40.28%, and Bridgewater was 59.72% for student population. The budget timeline uh, today is the hearing. Next Wednesday, at March 20th, there'll be a joint budget sub committee meeting between the school committee and the finance committees of the town, of both towns. That will be held at the superintendent's conference room in, in Bridgewater at 6.30 p.m. All are welcome. Wednesday, March 27th, school committee adoption of the fiscal year budget, as Sue said, at the Raynham Middle School at 7 o'clock. Again, all are welcome. Wednesday, April 24th, Certification of the fiscal year 20 total amount by the Bridgewater Raynham Regional School District's Treasurer. Tuesday, May 7th, Town of Bridgewater's final vote at the Academy Building at 7.30. And Monday, May 20th, Raynham Town Meeting, Raynham Middle School, 7 o'clock. Thank you for your time. And I guess we can come back. Oh, ha, best for last. In closing, <coughs> We face, as we face repeated decreases to requested assessments, the district strives to offer 21st century educational programs, rigorous instruction, and safe facilities driven by the student success model as a means of ensuring that Bridgewater Raynham Regional District students are successful academically, socially, emotionally throughout their K through 12 experience. Thank you.
So, Mr. Swenson, we are going to turn it over to you for any comments, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I would like to um, thank all the folks that, all their hard work that goes into the development uh, of an operational budget. Many folks may not realize, but the budget season, believe it or not, starts in October. Um, so we no sooner get our operational budget from uh, the previous year. We're about a month into school. We already start planning for the next fiscal year. Um, I meet with my <coughs> principals. I meet with my directors and managers, and they bring to me what they feel as though their schools or departments need to run at an optimal rate. Staffing requests in this budget were 18. When they originally came to me in October, it was 47 and a half. So a lot of work had to go into prioritizing um, those 18 positions. Um, and th those 47 and a half positions, that's okay. I encourage my folks to come to me and advocate for their buildings in their departments because our children and our folks deserve the best. With that being said, um, it comes to us and we work with um, the central office staff up until January to then present my preliminary budget. At that point, the school committee approves or does not approve, but they usually approve my preliminary budget and then it becomes their budget. And that's when the real work begins. I can't say enough about our school committee. I can't say enough about our budget subcommittee. Um, these folks are volunteers and they give umpty hours to this district and the dedication and hard work um, is definitely recognized and appreciated, so I thank all of them for their time. To the point where we get to tonight, and we have to make decisions about what we are gonna present here at the public hearing and go to the towns with. Obviously, as the superintendent, but also as a parent of children that go to this district to say that I'm disappointed, and this budget moving forward would be an understatement. Those 18 positions, those weren't wants, those are needs. Our communities are growing on both sides. Construction, home sales are through the roof, and that's great. It's the reason why my wife and I moved to the community of Rainham. We wanted to start a family. We knew that we had great schools. But with that, comes a responsibility from our towns to recognize that if this growth is gonna bring in school-aged children, the schools need to be supported in order to make sure that those students are given every opportunity to succeed each and every day. The biggest concern for me, class size obviously is a big one. I don't want my teachers to be sitting in classes of 28 to 30. Students, I don't want my students sitting in classes of 28 to 30 students. The social emotional piece is my biggest concern. I see our nurse leader sitting in the audience today, Marie Fahey. We have presented information at our preliminary budget hearing, at our joint meetings with the towns in October, at school committee meetings in the past about the uptick and social emotional issues of our students. If our students are not regulated, they cannot learn. If our students are not regulated, our teachers cannot teach. We need to make sure that yes, class size is reasonable, but we also need to make sure that socially and emotionally, these students are in good places to come to school each and every day and learn. And without that support, that's going to be a continuous uphill battle for us as a community and a learning community. And that's not a bridgewater Raynham issue. It's throughout the Commonwealth and unfortunately it's throughout our nation. Anxiety, depression, everything that our children are dealing with right now, okay, is at the forefront. We need to be doing more for that population. And if we're doing more for those students and they're becoming regulated, Sitting in a class of 26 to 27 may not be the greatest, but at least if they're regulated, they can come to an environment to the point where they can access the curriculum. It makes it a little easier for them and their teachers to teach and the students to learn. 
So with that being said, I don't mean to be doom and gloom, but it's just how I feel. And if anyone knows me, I tell people how I feel. Some people don't like that sometimes, but that's okay. But my job is to advocate, and to advocate for our children, and to advocate for my people. And this is not a budget that I feel serves either population well. So I do encourage our town leaders to really think about the assessments and see if there's any way that some changes could be made moving forward. We have a joint financial subcommittee meeting next week with both towns. I encourage our town leaders to get together and discuss this budget and see if there's anything we can do to work together collaboratively to move forward so that our teachers, most importantly our children, are supported. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone from the school? Any members of the school committee have any comments or questions? Madam Chair, uh, a comment uh, um, through you to either yourself or uh, the superintendent. Can you please explain to the audience how the assessments work, um, how the community, how the assessments for each community is offset off of the other one, just so everybody has an understanding of when a need is asked from one and it's not met, that it offsets the other automatically through state mandate? Well, it's the regional agreement that we have. Um, so the regional agreement basically states that if we request a number and um, either side, whether it be Bridgewater or Rainham, can't meet that assessment, we automatically have to go back and reduce the other side of the district's assessment as well. So it's not just one side not being able to handle that amount <coughs> and then the other half can kind of supplement that. We have to adjust that as well. So it's a one-two punch, really, truly. And that's the regional agreement that is current, how it's currently designed. It has been since regionalization. Thank you, I appreciate that. I know there's been a lot of talk of, of individuals that I've spoken to that were not um, sure of how that all worked. Everybody, I've talked to some people who thought it was an even split right down the middle, um, and some that did not know why if one was lower, the other one could not automatically just get the slack for it. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that explanation. You're welcome. Any other questions? A question, just a comment. Um, so Mr. Swenson talked about, Superintendent Swenson talked about the social emotional development needs of our students and myself and a couple of prior school committee members attended a conference in Hyannis um, that addressed that, the, the whole theme of it. Um, so he is accurate in saying that it's not just here. Of those 18 positions, um, I don't know if you're aware, but there was um, an adjustment council for the Williams <coughs> Intermediate School um, that was eliminated, an educational support professional with uh, applied behavioral um, analysis experience at the Williams Intermediate School, a district-wide special education school psychologist, and at the Rain on the Rainham side, um, a half-time adjustment counselor at Merrill and La Liberty. So we did attempt to address that. So anyone that thinks that we don't care about kids, they're dead wrong. <clears throat> Thank you. you know, Mrs. Holbert. Madam Chair, through you to Mr. Swenson or Ms. Macedo. Um, the a million dollar um, amount of money that's being taken from the E and D appropriation. Could you tell us about that? Is that a typical practice during the budget process? And if not, what does that mean for us going forward? I will say that in previous budgets we have um, used E and D funds or our free cash to offset the assessment amounts to the towns. Yes, that's true. Um, we have, um, by law, we are allowed to have 5% of our budget in E and D, which is somewhat over $3 million. Uh, however, the district has always contributed uh, some of those funds so that that would help lower the assessments to the town. Um, this year we were um, certified at 1.7, 
Uh, we were initially looking to use 900,000 of that so that we could also have some money to roll into the budget for 2021. Uh, however, we, uh, to try to make up that deficit, used another 100,000, so now we're up to a million. So that'll be less funds that we'll have for our 2021 budget. And are those funds like our rainy day? Those funds? are free cash. Those are undesignated funds. So if something were to go wrong in one of the buildings, that is the money that we would be using? That's the money we could access to repair or fix or whatever. Can I also add to that that a lot of that piece of that money is relied on the circuit breaker, which is incredibly complicated, but that's a piece of the special education monies that the state gives us back after we've spent a certain amount per pupil. So that varies year to year. So if we have a decrease in our special education population and we don't meet the circuit breaker, we're not going to have that money. So every year that That number changes. Correct. So yearly. we can't promise that we're going to have the circuit breaker recertified every year to put into E&D. So that's one of our fears is that at some point we may not be able to give a million. And then now it's going to come back on the town. And I think part of everyone's frustration here on this table is that I would have to say at least the last three or four budgets that we really have not had our assessments met by the, the two towns. They have given us increases. I do want to make that clear. Each town is giving us more than they gave last year, but they are not meeting the request that the superintendent and the school committee feel is necessary to run the schools that we feel is the best educational parts for our kids. So. Sure, Mr. Uh, Dolan. Sure, just to clarify, so right now our E and D has one point seven million dollars. Correct. For this budget, after this budget is taken is done, we'll only have <laughs> seven hundred thousand. So next year we won't have a million. Right. And then whatever we close um, at the end of fiscal year nineteen, which um, as we talked about uh, doing some pre purchasing um, to reduce the budget, we're going to be pre-purchasing out of district tuitions um, and some supplies and whatnot, um, based on what's left. Right. Um, so it doesn't appear that there will be a lot to put into E and D from 19's budget. So I'm just kind of banking on the seven that I know is there. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Macedo, could you also explain um, the miscellaneous receipts, uh, um, the Chapter 70 money, the money we're promised for transportation that we don't normally get, and Miss how that changes? Okay, so those are two different things. Right. Miscellaneous receipts is going to be the Medicaid um, money that you spoke of earlier, and that's money that we get from the state through the Medicaid program for students who have had medical services. For instance, like speech lang and speech and language therapy, um, OTPT, um, and there's like a whole menu that of services that get checked off, and we get reimbursed for that. Um, as far as the uh, Chapter 70 and Chapter 71, which is transportation, um, chap those are estimates from the state. We get that from the cherry sheet. And as you know, the governor's budget is the first go around, which is the numbers we've been using, but. That budget, the state budget, goes through a series of reiterations before it becomes final. Um, so those numbers are estimates. Now, should something happen during the year, like a 9C cuts, those numbers can be affected. And we may not get that. So they're all estimates at this point. So for transportation, for instance, we're typically, we're supposed to get 100%, but we maybe get between 60 and 70%. Is that fair to say? With transportation, what they do is they look at, while they're doing these estimates, the only information they have right now is my fiscal year 18 end of year report. And that information as to what we're eligible to be reimbursed on, those children that are a mile and a half or more, um, on those children, they're looking at a reimbursement rate. Right now, that looks like 74%. However, when they look at the real number, when they finally give us the money for the following year, they're going to look at FY19. So these are estimates. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the committee before we open it up to the public? Sure, Mr. Dolan. Could, uh, Madam Chair, just to 
complete that circle, Ms. Mosquito, state law, for those who don't know, state law says when we regionalized as a district, we were entitled to receive from the state 100% transportation reimbursement with the caveat of as long as that line item was funded in the budget. Subject to appropriation, correct. So, and clearly that has not been done. In my 32 years, I have seen, I believe, 99%. I have never seen 100. Thank you. Very good. Anyone else? Oh, one more comment. Um, sure. Mrs. Uh, King. To Mr. Swenson. <coughs> um, I know you worked very hard with Mr. Powers on the student success plan this year that we did approve, um, I believe, at our February meeting. Um, the mission of that success plan was excellence in education. So do you feel that with this budget for next year, will we achieve excellence in education for any of those four pillars? Well, the way I look at it is this. Um, those 18 positions obviously would assist us uh, in, in driving home that mission. Um, but one thing that we do have in this district are incredible people, incredible educators, support staff, custodial staff um, that do less, uh, more with less, and unfortunately have, have become used to that. And, I, would, I, and I, I wish that was not the case for them. But I look at a situation where last year we were in a similar situation and on the Rainham side at La Liberty, we have a school of recognition. So point being is, yes, do I feel like we could do this more efficiently if this budget was met with those 18 positions? Absolutely. But we still do the job we have to do each and every day. And that's a testament to my people So and, and the families that support us. So um, yeah, it'd be easier. But we're still going to open up the doors in September regardless. And we're still going to do the job that's, jobs that we've been hired to do and do them well. Yep. Um, but also it would, it would, getting through and doing our best is mm -hmm. not what we as a committee strive for Correct. our students. We want it, and, we've, and we've said that when we presented, Mr. Powers presented that, that this is a plan that could really move this district forward. Um, but it is a plan that... Um, we feel like we want to use as a roadmap to guide our budgetary process, um, but we feel like in certain situations like this, it's impacted by the budgetary process. And we can't do those things that we want to do within that plan that we feel like we want to do to truly move this district forward. But again, regardless of you know this budget or previous budgets we have incredible people that do what they need to do each and every day I just wish that we could support them and support our kids in a better way all right is that everyone mrs. Holbrook yes and on that same note <clears throat> the reductions in the impact to the student success plan and the curriculum are quite concerning to me um, as well as very disappointing Additionally, I'm greatly concerned about the social and emotional supports that were taken out of the budget with the influx of students that are needing those supports. Class size is another area of concern for me. Over the years, class size at the elementary level have been creeping up. Class sizes were in the low to mid-20s and currently they're ranging between the mid and upper 20s. So I realize the towns have a fiscal responsibility to all municipal departments. <coughs> and there is only so much money to go around. But as a school committee member, I have an obligation to advocate for our schools at both the local and state levels. In turn, I continue, I encourage you to continue to advocate for our schools um, at both the local and state levels. It is what our students and staff deserve. Good. Everyone all set on the committee? 
right, very good. So now we will open it up to the public. If you would like to speak, please come to the podium. And please try to keep it limited to the three minutes in case we have many people that would wish to speak. We do have some copies of the presentation, obviously not enough for everybody that's here, but if you'd like one, they're up here on our table. Oh, it'll be made available to the public as well. Hello, my name is Lisa Borgini and I live at 11 Titicut Road in Rainham. I come from a family of educators and I have three main points that I'd like to make. Um, the first one is, as many of people have already indicated, Class size is absolutely critical to success. Um, a Harvard longitudinal study followed students from kindergarten all the way through to adulthood many years ago, and they found that of every single quality in that kindergarten classroom, the most important thing for success was class ratio to teacher to student. And they said the optimum, optimum side was, size was 10 to 1. <laughs> So you can just see how horrified I am at the 27 to 1 that we're talking about for first grade. Um, discipline becomes what we're doing. We're not teaching. As a teacher, I've been teaching for 25 years in higher education. I teach at the community college level. And it's just a very different classroom. Um, my second point is we're facing an anxiety epidemic in America among our youth. I'm here to tell you, I teach public speaking, and I'm more nervous talking to you than I am to my class, <laughs> uh, because you're adults and I don't have any grades in charge of you. <laughs> but um, it's incredible to me, in the last 25 years, the change in the student body. I administer a pre and post test among my students in terms of their anxiety level. At the beginning of the semester, it's a very established test. It's been happening for 20 years. Every single one of my students in the community college level, 18 to 25 roughly, mostly, every single one of my students except for one this semester tested high or moderate levels of anxiety. I have students who are afraid and nervous and anxious about coming to campus. And I don't think that's any different than the high school and middle school and elementary school level. I think we need to address that and to not have those psychological needs met, especially with the 27 students in a classroom, that's a safety concern. Because students will fall through the cracks. And I don't want any of our children to fall through that crack. My third point is that we are in a creative economy. We were in a factory economy, then we were in an information age, now we're in a creative age. We need to support the creative arts at an incredibly high level for our students to succeed. The jobs that our students, that my, uh, one of my two daughters are in, in Rainham Public Schools, the jobs they're gonna have haven't even been created yet. They say that 60% of the jobs that our youth will have don't even exist yet. So we need to teach them to think creatively and to think critically. That's why arts and music are so critical. And I think that that isn't even talked about here. I mean, we have 18 positions that were needed that have been cut. I think this budget is short-sighted, and I want to applaud the school committee and the superintendent for their hard work, and I really hope that the towns will listen and make some changes. Thank you. Welcome, Mrs. Riley. Thank you, uh, Pat Riley, Rainham resident, member of the Rainham Board of Selectmen, and former very proud member of the Bridgewater Rainham School Committee for 12 years. And I just have to say that one of the hardest decisions I made was deciding not to run for re-election because I enjoyed it so much. But tonight is the first night that I'm happy I'm not sitting up there with you. <laughs> I can imagine the anguish that you've gone through putting together this budget and presenting this. You know, it should be that the, pres the print superintendent's budget is the what we should have, the should have budget. And the school committee's budget is what we really need. But that's not what's addressed here. 
This is not even meeting that basic level of what our schools need, and that is very sad. I keep hearing mention of the towns, the towns, but I just want to, with all due respect to our partners in Bridgewater, I just have to state that at the first budget meeting back in the fall, Gil Aligi, chairman of the Rainham Finance Committee, and Linda DeMello, the representative to the selectmen, said that the intent of the Rainham Finance Committee was to meet the assessment that was asked of for the budget that the school committee uh, would propose based on what we need. And um, finance committee members wanted to be here tonight. They had other obligations. They could not. They will be at the meeting next week. But they asked me to share their frustration. And they um, have asked to, to discuss with the selectmen certain possibilities, in addition to possibility of gifting money to the district. We've done that in the past. We don't like to do that because it's not the right thing to do in a regional district. In the past, we have gifted money for supplies, I believe, and equipment, and wants to save positions, never to create positions. But I think the Finance Committee and many others realize how serious the situation is. And they may be considering gifting possibly three positions, maybe a first grade teacher, a seventh grade teacher, and a counselor. Again, nothing's been decided, and it's a kind of a last resort, not something that we want to do because it creates an inequity in the district, and that is not good. That's not what the regional district is supposed to be. But that comes out of a sense of frustration. You know, years ago, many years ago, schools committees used to have an autonomy, fiscal autonomy, because some very wise people realized that nothing is more important than the education we provide our students. They didn't ask to come into this world. We owe them the best education we can give them so that they can strive to have a good life and give back to the communities and be part of the communities, be part of the process, be part of the wonderful district that we have here. So it's really, it's really very sad if um, we have to go with a budget that includes zero for textbooks and supplies, no new positions, not addressing those concerns the speaker before me so eloquently addressed, that anxiety, I understand that's experienced even at the kindergarten level. It's amazing. We're not dealing with, as she so eloquently pointed out, the students that we've dealt with in the past. So um, as I just wanted to bring that message from the Finance Committee, and certainly work with our partners in Bridgewater, but we realize that this is not what we want for our students. Kind of the irony of it is, is the reason why we're looking at high class sizes in the town of Rainham is because we had a teacher in Rainham retire last year, and that position was not filled because last year's assessment wasn't met. So it, it's cumulative is the point, and it will continue to be. And we really need to realize education is, is so important. We need to put it, put it as a priority. Thank you. And again, thank you so much to the school committee for all your hard work in the administration. Believe me, I understand the anguish and the frustration you're going through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Sure. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dennis Gallagher. I'm a councilman over in Bridgewater. And I think it's fair to say to, to everybody here tonight that this is still a working document. Um, the town of Bridgewater has not finalized um, any budget as of yet, we have some preliminary numbers as was presented today, and we're still working on the budget. We haven't finalized anything, but we have had some discussions about it, and we have a meeting a week from tonight to continue the discussion, and then the council and Bridgewater will continue to, to discuss the needs uh, that the school system does have. I will say that the meeting that we had a few months ago where the social emotional um, element of the budget certainly hit core with a lot of us, um, certainly to me. So I, I hope that we can work uh, together to try to do something so you can address at least some of that needs uh, going forward in fiscal 20. Um, but um, you said the, the resources and revenues are, are tight. Um, at the moment, Bridgewater has, has put forward the best that they can at the moment, but I do think that as we move forward, perhaps uh, some tweaking to the budget will, will be done. I don't know to what extent, um, but I'm just one of nine, and, uh, 
and we have a, a town manager that works with our finance team to put things together. So um, this is the period of time that we have these, these discussions. Nothing has been finalized, and um, I don't think that they will until May. But um, I know as one counselor, and I can't speak for all of, all of them in Bridgewater, that we certainly all understand the needs and concerns of the district. And I think that the, the effort from most of my colleagues, if not all, are, are there. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else who'd like to speak? Sure. Hi, my name is Sam Baumgarten, 60 Short Street, Bridgewater. I have a question first. If I read the, the uh, PowerPoint correctly, there's a, a fairly large increase in the administrative piece of the pie, about 20%. And I'm wondering if you could explain that increase. It's uh, the technology licenses actually come within that line as well. So that's what um, really equates for that increase. It's not increased admin by any means. No, it just seems like a large chunk compared to every other every other item. There's no additional admin. It's um, it was just the technology licenses come under that series. So Thank you. And I had one other observation. Last night I was at the town council meeting in Bridgewater, and a parent stood up. And I don't know if you're here tonight, Mrs. Silva from Tommy Ann Terrace, but um, she spoke about the budget concerns and it, and mentioned that. Um, concern about class size, especially with regard to the younger ages. And she mentioned about how kindergarten education has become uh, with higher levels that keep moving down to kindergarten. So we're teaching kindergartners like first graders and second graders, and we're expecting more and more of them. And then she said, you know, we really need more people to help with social emotional issues. And when she sat down, I. I said to myself, I wonder if anybody else in here saw the irony in what she just said. Because we have put a lot of stress onto five and six year olds to therefore create more social emotional issues. And maybe if we can fix that, we won't need so many counselors as we move forward. I think we really need to rethink how we're approaching young children. And uh, my children are not that far removed from school, but they used to have a half day kindergarten, and they'd go home and they'd relax. And uh, I think we're expecting a little too much, which then creates more stress. So some of it is our, our own doing as education has changed, as testing has increased. We need to take a, another look at how we do things. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Keith Buell, 10 Fieldcrest Drive in Bridgewater, um, who has never had a child who's ever gone through BR, um, but I've been advocating for education for about 20 years. Um, I'm speaking as a Bridgewater resident, and I'm speaking as possibly someone that's on the other side looking at this budget. And the one thing that's going through social media right now, and I, I'm hoping you can explain so that if somebody's watching this that might be on the fence, that it might be able to turn the tide a little bit. But I saw somewhere, and it's been printed out there, that enrollment is down um, over the past few years. Uh, and the question that a lot of people who don't get invested in, in researching this type of situation is how can class sizes be going up if enrollment's going down? Um, through you, Chairman, uh, could you please have someone address that just in case someone's watching that might not understand? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Swenson. Sure. So if you look at the overall enrollment, um, it has declined um, a bit over time. However, because when we get to, we look at uh, students uh, in eighth grade often going to the high school level. Um, many students may go a vocational track, they may go an agricultural track, they might go to a parochial school, a private school. So that's kind of where we have seen our dip. But if you look at our K-4 numbers, our K through four population, and I know this because I had to present this information to MSBA um, about a year or two ago, 
when we were trying to get into uh, the eligibility phase for the Mitchell Elementary School project. And we looked at a longitudinal look at cohorts of students, grades K-5. If we took a kindergarten class in, say, 2014, and over time, when that kindergarten class then becomes first grade, down to second to fourth, each section grew by about 25 students per cohort. So even though overall enrollment may have decreased over time, the population is growing, and it's growing at the elementary level where we're seeing these high class sizes. And it makes sense, because parents aren't going to most likely uproot their family and move to Bridgewater or Rainham when their students are in middle school or in high school. They're gonna move into the communities when they're going to start a family, where the students are close to school aged. So what we're seeing is those populations are growing. And over time, if we're able to retain those students within our district, that overall enrollment is going to grow over time because they're going to remain within our, within, our, um, within our district. So point being is, even though overall enrollment might be declining, it's on the rise at the younger populations. And that's where we're seeing these high class sizes. And we just stated that last year, because we could not fill a position at the uh, elementary school because we could not make the assessment number. So what we did instead of laying off, we looked at positions through attrition. Because when you lay off an employee, you actually have to lay off two employees to cover the cost of unemployment. So what we try to look at is folks that are retiring, if we cannot fill that position, Okay, we don't have to then pay unemployment costs and we don't have to, you know, what we really don't want to do is lay off our people. But what ends up happening, it's still a reduction in force. We're still having less teachers in certain areas, especially at the elementary. So right now, where we used to have seven sections of first grade at Merrill, we now have six. And now we have a kindergarten class this year going into next year that's even higher from a grade level perspective. So we're looking at 27 to 28 just to start the school year. So the way I see it is sometimes numbers lie and sometimes liars yeah. use numbers. That happens. But yes, the overall part is de decreased, but there are, it's definitely on the rise at our early elementary number. Uh, Thank you. I think that explanation. If I, if I could, Max. Sure. Mr. Um, Dolan. To Mr. Swenson's point about the kindergarten numbers being at 27 and 28, that's before our summer move-ins. Mm -hmm. To be clear, Last year, we had 250 summer move-ins. Now, granted, that was both sides of the district across all grade levels, but we still had 250 move-ins last year. That is a large number for us not to be able to plan for in a budget. Um, I also want to sort of echo the point of the, the enrollment number piece, the irony of our, our, our older grades going down. I realize it's speculation, but I'm forced to speculate that if over time we had been funded properly as a school district, would we have lost those older kids? Would they still be here? Would they be going to the high school instead of going to a private school or a Aggie school or some other option? So I, I push back on that argument as well using that that standpoint. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's important to explain it time and time and time again because uh, that's one of the, the other number that always comes up year after year after year is dollar spent per student. Um, th through you again, Madam Chairman, does someone have that information that can be provided? Per pupil cost is about 12, 12, five, or 12,500. And do you know what the state average is? We're, I think we're below the state yeah, average. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what the state average is actually is right now, but we are below the state average. I mean, again, I, th I think that's important that mm -hmm. that's a, a two-number thing that people resonate with, and I, I think it's important to get that information out there. Yeah. And I would and I would say this. I, I, I know we're talking a lot about the talents, but the state mechanism for funding education needs to be changed as well. It, has, it hasn't been adjusted since Ed Reform in 93. The world's changed quite a bit since 1993. 
So the state really needs to recognize that that formula needs to be tweaked as well. So um, we are advocating, uh, we had a group of teachers at uh, Bridgewater State University a few weeks ago, uh, working with MTA and our local union, BREA, uh, advocating for some bills that may be coming down the pike that would help increase um, some funding from the state level that would be an influx to us at the local level. So, um, you know, I, I would encourage um, parents and families to, to not only advocate at the local level with your councilmen and selectmen, but also with your representatives and senators at the state level as well. And then the last thing for my three minutes. Um, <laughs> the, I've never talked three minutes in my life. Um, I'm sure the invitation has been made, but if it hasn't, uh, it should be to both the state rep and the state senator to attend um, next Wednesday's meeting. Um, and um, they declined, I would re-invite them. I think it's very important for both of them to be there. I also think it's important that if anybody's gonna go in from the, the town of Bridgewater and gonna go and advocate for funds, that you take a quick peek at the budget and see where those funds can come from. Because one of the things is that if we're gonna take money that I feel is deserved to the school, um, and you just go up and say that, that's one thing. But if you can go up and say, okay, I looked at the budget, and I see these dollars going here, do they have to go here or can there be something changed? It's a much more prudent argument. I don't think anybody in Bridgewater doesn't want our kids to be educated. They might vote against this, they might vote against the school, they might post on social media, but I don't think there's anybody that's against education. Um, you know, it's just this tug of war between town and school has been going on for years and years and years and years, um, and it gets tougher every time. Um, so I think if you're going to advocate um, and you want somebody uh, on that council to listen, go in there with a, with a plan, you know. Go in there with a plan of where you think dollars might be able to be moved into this budget so that the kids can get what this, and thank you for your service, um, which is unpaid. Um, and. Uh, and go in with a plan um, to, to, to they're going to listen a little bit more. Um, it's happened before where they've given money um, after the fact. As Councillor Gallagher said, it's a working program. But the other thing to understand is once it's approved in Bridgewater, and that's improved, if something happens in Bridgewater, they can never touch that budget. And that's another thing that people think about when they're voting, you know, and when they're talking to their counselors about how they want them to vote, you know, is once the towns voted the budget, if something would happen in Bridgewater, um, the money has to come from everybody else and it just can't come from the school. And these are the things that we battled. These are the things that we have to use when we want to make arguments for why we think, not just because we love our kids and because they deserve the education that we want them to have, which I, like I said, I think everybody wants, but we have to be able to go in there next Wednesday night, you know, with more than just we need money, you know, and if you can come with that, they're gonna listen. You know, and somebody on TV is going to listen and they're going to say, geez, maybe we can make other movements within the budget and just try to be prepared and call your state rep and call your state senator and, and write them and tell them. Because it's not about just this year. It's going to be next year and it's going to be the year after that. Um, it's all over, the, all over the country, school districts. I'm from Pennsylvania and my school district's going through this. <coughs> I grew up in. It's going through the exact same thing that we're going through here. They have a regional high school and they're going through the exact same thing. It's everywhere. So you gotta keep calling them, you gotta keep bothering them. You can't just come out when it's time right now, the week <coughs> before the budget. You, know, you should start writing your state senator and your state rep for next year, the week after this budget is approved. Yes and then write them every week after that. <laughs> Excuse me, Madam Chair, if I could just make one uh, point that sure. I just wanted to add on to, uh, to uh, Mr. Buell's, uh, his first comment. Um, just so everybody understands where mm -hmm. the, um, the students are coming from and, and, the, and the, the numbers being a little bit smaller. So I, I've, I've had this as a school committee member, a conversation of parents that have, uh, I've spoken to that have taken their children in the high school area ages out of district. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the school district here is still on the hook for where those students go. Uh, it's not that they're going to another school district and there's somebody else's problem. The taxpayers are still paying for those students if they want to go out of the district. A lot of people don't realize also that we only accept school choice 
at the high school um, at the high school level because we can't afford to tack on any more students at the lower levels but other communities do accept our students at the lower levels again we are on the hook as a district and as taxpayers for those funds to go through those K through eight, uh, um, the one through eight age groups. So just because we don't accept K through um, the one through eight, K through eight, we still have people in our communities that do go out of district, and we as taxpayers have to fund those through our budget. Thank you. Sure. If they go to public school, not for those parochial schools or private schools, right. just for the public charters, West Bridgewater, et cetera, other schools, et cetera, school choice. <laughs> Sure, come on up. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Ashley Mallard and I'm a teacher here at Bridgewater Rainham. I teach ninth grade and I have about one third of the freshman class might be climbing to a higher number since the history position that is actually a retiree um, didn't get filled. I am a resident of West Bridgewater. Can I still speak? I just it? said that. I just asked something. I Madam just Chair, I'd like to make a motion to uh, allow Ms. Mallard to speak. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. The reason I followed up is I was <clears throat> the teacher who attended and invited the school committee and superintendent to recently speak in regards to the Fund Our Future campaign, which is just a, the Cherish Act and Promise Act is a new method of new formula to. Um, change the way education is going to be funded and Senator Pacheco is in favor of this. He's a um, sponsor of the bill so it was a great suggestion to reach out. But um, <clears throat> you asked what the per pupil expenditures were. Out of 322 districts, and I was like sort of embarrassed to admit this because I grew up in Bridgewater. My dad taught in the district for 38 years. I took his job when he retired. Thank God someone hired me. I worked my butt off and did student teaching here and wanted, wanted to come back. I left Hingham to come back here voluntarily, and people were like, are you nuts? And I lost my job the next year to, pay, to cuts. And luckily, I was brought back, thankfully, under Principal Watson, and I'm super excited to come up to the high school. Out of 322 districts, Bridgewater Rainham ranks 297. <clears throat> I've heard people who send their kids to West Bridgewater thinking it's smaller class sizes. They pay worse per pupil expenditure. So does Whitman Hanson. <clears throat> and East Bridgewater is one of the worst in the state, 320 with their shiny new school. Oh yeah, West Bridgewater has a shiny new school too and so does BR from the outside. I know we still look pretty. And I had suggested this as a history teacher. This is the Gilded Age of Education. You are surviving on the hard work of my coworkers, administrators. When I was in the middle school, I had two years of Spanish. I had health, so I was more prepared for the obstacles that faced me. I had dare, and I chose to say no. <laughs> <laughs> and when I got up to the high school, I was one year ahead. I had Spanish five, doesn't even exist anymore here. Okay, these are t opportunities your, child, uh, your children are losing out on and not at the expense of the lack of enthusiasm from the teachers, these just positions don't exist anymore. And those cuts started actually when I was in high school and um, I went off to college and I s remember the school shutting the doors at like one o'clock in the afternoon because funding became so bad and the state came in and demanded we fix our doors and the new school got built and more teachers eventually got hired and then the economy crashed again and we've been inching our way back. Two weeks ago I spent $500 on my credit card, thank God I get paid tomorrow, um, for class supplies that I just won't be using, my department will be sharing. Um, and earlier this year um, I spent $600 on basic classroom supplies and I'm also still working off of construction paper that I savaged, scal saved from my parents with their combined over 70 years of education. I chose this career because I watched my parents enjoy it. I watched all the teachers of Bridgewater Rainham growing up work together with administrators. <coughs> I can tell you all the old superintendents who used to come eat breakfast at my house where we all can get along. But I also remember the members of the community voting 
to have overrides and coming together for breakfast for Santa and eat with the characters. And if you're an old timer, you'll remember the Halloween events that the town used to run and the teachers used to dress up in. That's not the community that exists anymore. And I, I don't know where it got lost. I don't know where 400 houses can pop up and then they think they don't need to throw any more money into the school. I would love to have children that come into my classroom happy every single day, but I know it's not happening. Sometimes my room gets designated a safe room. If you walk by, you might see a kid hanging out next to my desk. I'm not like just chit-chatting with them. It's like they're having a bad day, so they know they can come just hang out in my room and have a moment and a break and a mental help, you know? We're we talked today about <clears throat> social emotional support systems. How quickly do I need to get to a certain fact in my class when my kid had a bad weekend with their parents. These are the things that the teachers know that we can't talk about, but when I have a classroom of 28 kids with no extra desks, even though I've asked for one for two weeks, Ms. Watson, um, <laughs> these, these are the types of things that we're struggling with. I can't incorporate the 21st century skills because I can't get regular computers that have consistent access to the internet. It just went down the other day after school, and it's not to anyone's dismay, but it's, it, it's not one person you can sit this on, but I hate to see that Bridgewater consistently is not meeting the same expectations that Rainham has. This is not what we want to bring our kids into. And let me just remind you, 297 out of 322. 297 out of 322 per pupil expenditure. I'll leave you with that. And uh, thank you very much for letting me speak. And I appreciate the hard work. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? So just to build off that a little bit, so I'm Patrick Smith, I live at 310 Auburn Street, Bridgewater. So I have a, uh, I have a, a uh, seven-year-old that's in second grade and a kindergartner that'll be going to school in September. And I just want to be reassured I just want to know that why, you know, looking at the budget and what it's going to be and, and how many Bridgewater Finance or, or the Budget Committee is here tonight. So there's one. I think that's pretty telling. And, and I, we hear all this time, but, you know, it matters to us and it matters to the council and it matters to everyone. We were 18 teacher deficit. So how much does it really matter to you? That's the questions I have. What's going to stop me from, you know, I'm contemplating right now putting my house in the market and finding another school system. That's how bad things have gotten. And she's right, we're building homes behind Curve Street where we, you know, we're down to school. My daughter is literally at a table with six other kids. And that's frustrating to me as a father because I moved, when I retired from the military, I moved here because it was a great school system and it was, like she said, a sense of community. And then the five years we've been here, that's completely gone. It just doesn't exist anymore. And it's to the point where I'm thinking about leaving the town because it's gotten that bad. And I'm concerned that there's only one council member here tonight. And I understand there's a meeting next week, but that, I mean, there's a, you know, 100 parents in this room. I mean, they should represent, well, you know, they're representing us. They should be here to talk the piece, but they're not. And that bothers me. And that's why I'm contemplating, you know, leaving a town that I, that I love for the last five years because I, I, I want to find something better for my kids because that's what my whole life is about, is about making sure that my kids get the best education possible. And I'm just really concerned about that. But I appreciate the hard work. I know it's not on you guys, but it's just really telling that no one else is here tonight to talk to us about the actual budget. So thank you. Madam Chair, if I could, um, your question was to who's here from finance. I, I know there are other counselors in the room. Um, I just want to pay uh, an acknowledgement to them. I think I saw Mr. Chase in the back. Yes. Um, oh, there he is. Uh, Mr. George is here. So I'm, right, I'm right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, Sean George, uh, Jillian's Way. Uh, I'm a resident and I'm a parent of a freshman in Bridgewater, and I also sit in the town council. <clears throat> um, 
it <coughs> I, I I understand everybody's concerns and frustrations. <laughs> Gonna have to give me a minute, I'm a little little jazzed here. <laughs> um, I think there's a there's a belief Unfortunately, social media is a blessing and a curse that the council and the finance committee doesn't care. And the fact that we don't care bothers people, rightfully so, but it's not true. I appreciate our partners in Raynham and that they have the abilities to meet their obligations. Bridgewater, I could tell you, we would love to meet all of our obligations. We don't sit there and try to figure out how not to meet them. But every town has unique challenges. The things that we have to take into consideration. There's things that we have to deal with that our partner doesn't. We talked about, you talked about the school funding. Well, the state funding for state aid, that doesn't work for us either. Let's keep in mind, we've got a university. We've got a prison. We've got an MBTA station. Those are things that Bridgewater has. You could say benefits from. There's a good argument for that. But there's no revenue generated from that. Those are the things that we take in as well. So as my fellow counselor said, the preliminary budget is still a work in progress. And I wish I could stand here and honestly say that everything's going to be good. That would be disingenuous and it actually wouldn't be right. But I think working together, we'll do, the, the, we'll do the best that we can because we want to make sure that our community, our kids, our educators, our public safety, our highway department, whatever, can do the best that they can. But unfortunately, with the limited resources that we have, we've got to make some decisions that aren't very popular. I'm not happy about it either. I wish I could stand up here and, give, and paint you a better picture. But the one thing I hope you walk away from is this. I'm not trying to get you not to be frustrated, but we are working hard for our community, for our kids, for our educators. And unfortunately, sometimes it may not be the message that we want to deliver, but we're doing the best we can. Thank you. Sure, come on up. Yes. yes. My name is Joe Bickle, 176 Carriage Hill Drive, Rainham. Mr. George, that was a very good explanation. Um, and I think for informational purposes only, a lot of members of our communities do not understand what percentage of each town's total budget the school department makes up. And I think we'd be remiss in not mentioning that. Um, can an elected official in here correct me if I'm wrong, if it comes in somewhere around 50% of each town's budget? Would that sound about right? Okay, so we're talking significant amounts of money. And there's no doubt that the kids deserve the best. And the staff at the BR school system does the best they can, and I think as a father with two children in the system, they do a rem remarkable job. But this is a very tough problem. I do not think it helps if we start pointing fingers from one district to another district. We have to find a long-term solution, because if I'm reading the statistics correctly, the assessments on each town went up by over 3%. Am I understanding that correctly? Proposition two and a half, you can only tax the town without an override at two and a half percent, which means this is gonna be a problem next year, the year after, the year after, and it's a cumulative total. So I do not have the answers, I do not have the solutions. It is a very difficult problem, but we have to understand everybody who's elected is doing the best that they can. No one wants subpar for our children, but the only thing I really wanted to stress here was it's 50% of the town's budget, and that's a significant thing. Thank you for your time. Did you want to comment on that piece about the assessment? Uh, just the, um, Mr. Bickle, just the, the individual assessments are over three. 
but that's not the overall budget increase is what, Ms. Macedo? Two yeah, it's about two. Is that what the, yeah. without the debt yes. Three point two three. Okay. Yep. And that's without the debt exclusion, right? Yes. With, with the debt exclusion. Is that with debt? Two point four eight around. That's without debt. Correct. Okay. So the debt is making it look a little better than it is. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bickle. Three point three seven. Three point three seven without the debt exclusion. <laughs> Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? All right, very good. Well, thank everyone very much thank for you. attending. Me, Madam uh, Chair. Sure. Uh, it seems like we have a packed audience tonight, which is which is great. Um, should we possibly get a, a poll of who will be attending next Wednesday night's meeting? Because I do not think the uh, superintendent's conference room will be able to uh, handle this capacity. All right. Well, and, and we'll not be televised. Uh, could we just have a show of hands who would like to attend next Wednesday night's meeting? All right. So we'll need to maybe find a new location. <laughs> um, why don't, where else could we fit that? I mean, we could use this working. We could do it here and we could move the tables a little bit so that we could have our working group. Okay. Yeah. So why don't we, uh, we'll have to put this out into the media, but why don't we, we can still post the meeting. Okay, we're gonna have the meeting here um, next Wednesday and we're gonna start at 6.30. Okay, and we'll have to reach out to all those people that we invited that maybe are not here so that we can clarify that. Um, Angelo and Mark. Okay, all right, very good. So I would like a motion um, to adjourn our public hearing and reconvene an executive session per Mass General Law Chapter 30A uh, slash 21 uh, to discuss strategy with respect to a pre preparation for collective bargaining when an open discussion may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the committee to conduct a grievance hearing regarding Article 9 of the ASME Council 93-1700 Collective Bargaining Agreement approve the executive session minutes of November 28, 2018, and the school committee will adjourn and will not reconvene an open session for the purpose of conducting any other business. Motion by Mr. Dolan, second, second by Mrs. Coparis, and we do need a roll call. Mr. Moreira? Aye. Mrs. Coparis? Aye. Mr. Gelfi? Aye. Mrs. King? Aye. Mrs. Holbrook? Aye. Mr. Dolan? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you very much, Thank everyone. You, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you next year. Uh, next, next year. Week. Next week. Next, next week. week. I'm sorry. <laughs>